Well, an important application of the discrete Fourier transform is to perform spectral analysis. That is to approximate the Fourier transform of a signal. So we're going to use it as a numerical tool to analyze the frequency content of continuous time signals. If you think about starting with a continuous time signal, which has a Fourier transform, and we want to analyze that data numerically, then we have to take some steps to uh, convert it to a form that we can analyze. And there's three steps that we're going to talk about in this lecture. The first step is we have to sample the signal in time, because we can't deal with a continuous signal in the computer. The second step is to truncate the signal in time, because we need to have a finite number of samples that we operate on. We can't store an infinite number in the computer. And then finally, in the frequency domain, we want something that's also discrete, not a continuous function of frequency. So we're going to sample in frequency using the DFT. And the question is, if we use these three steps, how well can we approximate the Fourier transform? So we're going to look at each step in sequence. So I've written the Fourier transform definition up here at the top. That is, capital X of omega is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of X of t e to the minus j omega t dt. When we sample in time, we can think about that as yielding a Riemann sum approximation to the integral. The integral is just a fancy way of writing a summation. We're basically adding up the values or the area under this function here. So if I replace x of t by its samples, I can approximate this integral as the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of nt times e to the minus j omega nt times t. So we can think of that as I've drawn in this picture here. Suppose the black curve represents x of t e to the minus j omega t, the quantity that we're integrating. And what we're going to do is sample that quantity and we're going to then approximate the integral by adding up these little rectangles. They have width t and their value is x of nt times e to the minus j omega nt. Well, if we carry this sum a little bit further, we see that this can be also written as t times the sum n equals minus infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega t n, which is just t times the discrete time for a transform. We can ask, what is the impact of this approximation on the integral? And we know from the sampling theorem that we have to sample x of t at at least twice the highest frequency component in x of t. So the signal x of t is going to be relatively smooth with respect to our sampling interval. Therefore, approximating the integral using this Riemann sum should do a pretty decent job. Now it turns out, of course, that as we decrease the sampling interval, t, or increase the sampling frequency, the quality of the approximation with the Riemann sum is going to improve. So this quantity we can take care of by, uh, if we need to, we can oversample the signal and so on. So this, the error induced by this Riemann sum approximation is very much under our control. So the next step in our approximation process is we're going to have to truncate the signal to capital N samples because we can't evaluate in a computer a sum that goes from n equals minus infinity to infinity. So for convenience, we're going to allow this sum to go from 0 to capital N minus 1. And our quantity that we're going to compute to approximate our Fourier transform is t times sum n equals 0 to n minus 1 of x of n e to the minus j omega t times n. And we'll add the subscript n to indicate that this is a length n approximation to our Fourier transform. And we can write this by defining a signal z of n to be equal to x of n on the interval 0 to n minus 1 and 0 otherwise. And of course, this signal is going to have discrete time Fourier transform z of e to the j omega. I can look at x hat of n of omega as t times the discrete time Fourier transform of z evaluated at frequency lowercase omega equal to uppercase omega times t. And this gives us a way of interpreting the effect of truncating. In particular, we'll represent z as the product of x, our original signal, which goes from minus infinity to infinity, 
times a window function w of n. And this window function picks out the values of x that we're going to use in our approximation. So w is 1 whenever n is between 0 and n minus 1, and it's 0 otherwise. And when I take the discrete time for a transform to look at what z of omega, how that is related to x of e to the j omega, I know that the product of signals transforms to a convolution. And there happens to be a 1 over 2 pi that's inserted in this case. So z of omega is just 1 over 2 pi times x of e to the j omega convolved with w of e to the j omega. And w is the discrete time Fourier transform of the window function, which in this case we can compute exactly and involves a ratio of sines, which has a sink-like behavior. Well, we're going to analyze the effect of this convolution in more detail in another lecture. But for now, convolving x with the sink function will distort x of e to the j omega. Okay, now, if w were an impulse, then the convolution wouldn't change x of e to the j omega. But it's not an impulse. If I just sketch the magnitude, it's got some side lobes and then a main lobe and so on. So this will blur out details and these side lobes will actually reduce our dynamic range in the spectrum. But we'll look at that in more detail later. Finally, we can't look at the discrete time for a transform directly because that involves an infinite number of frequencies. It's a continuous function of omega. So we're going to sample at specific frequencies at omega sub k equal to 2 pi divided by capital M times k. So we're assuming that we're taking M samples and that M is greater than or equal to N, our truncation length. So we can write this out. We have x hat sub n, so it's a length n approximation, at frequencies omega, capital omega sub k, which is just related to lowercase omega sub k through our relationship omega is equal to capital omega times t. So our approximation now becomes t times the sum n equals 0 to n minus 1 x of n e to the minus j 2 pi over mt times k times tn, and the t's here cancel out, so we end up with the sum x of n e to the minus j omega 2 pi over m k n, and this is just the discrete time Fourier transform evaluated at omega k, which is 2 pi over m times k. So we can write this as t times the discrete Fourier transform zk, where we're taking the DFT using a length m sequence. So we started with z of n having capital N non-zero values. We're padding with zeros out to length m and then taking the DFT to get zk. Well, by increasing m, in other words, adding more zeros, we can sample z of omega as densely as we wish. Okay, so we can get a very good representation of t times z of e to the j omega by just increasing m. However, this increasing m does not eliminate the distortion that we introduced in the truncation step when we convolved the DTFT of x of n with the window function w of e to the j omega. In summary, we're starting off with a continuous time signal and we want the Fourier transform of that signal, sketched here perhaps as x of omega. So in our first step, we're going to sample this signal at intervals of cap t, and the impact of sampling is to limit the bandwidth that we can study in x of omega, because we have to satisfy the sampling theorem, and that's going to cause us to limit ourselves to some interval, 0 to the sampling frequency divided by 2. Now this signal still has an infinite number of samples, so to do further computer-based analysis, we're going to have to truncate this signal to capital N samples, and that truncation is also equivalent to windowing the signal. In other words, multiplying the signal by a window function that selects certain parts of the signal and gets rid of other parts. This windowing introduces smoothing and distortion into the discrete time Fourier transform. So z of e to the j omega is not going to have the same shape as x of omega, 
because of the blurring due to, in this case, with this rectangular window, use of a sync function in the frequency domain. And then finally, we're going to take a DFT of Z of N with capital M samples. We'll multiply by T, and that gives us our approximation T Z of K for X hat of omega. The first step, sampling in time, is pretty well characterized, and we understand the impact of that. The last step, sampling in frequency, is something that we've also studied quite well. And the step that remains to be looked at more carefully is the windowing and truncation step.